try and pick up a couple of links um, that may be connected to our guests. Sometimes it's a little bit tenuous, but maybe this is right. So look, the big link, um, I wanted to talk about beauty. And the obvious link is the beautiful game that is absorbing many of us right now um, with Euro 2020 in 2021. Even people like me can appreciate a beautiful pass and the collaboration of the team and all that, um, though I'm not a regular football supporter. Um, and it felt appropriate because, you know, my rather free, open, perhaps somewhat stereotypical appropriation of things Frenchness is to think of beauty. You know, I think of fashion, I think of food, I think of the French having taste. Um, I do remember trying to explain once to someone in France that there's an English taste, le goût anglais, and uh, that took quite some explanation. They didn't seem like having taste at all to them, I don't think. Um, and even, even a building like the Pompidou Centre, we kind of excuse, because although to my mind it looks as ugly as sin, you kind of appreciate the boldness um, as if it's trying to do something different and make an impression and so on. So anyway, but look, it's also, I think that beauty is quite a good quality to think about right now. Um, as a sort of felt guide to life. And I wanted to try and, uh, and just give a moment or two on that. Um, you, you, it's, uh, just to stay at the top, you don't have to agree about what's beautiful. The point is that we human beings agree to talk about what's beautiful. As it were, we will have different opinions and there's the politicization of beauty and all the rest of it as well. Um, but nonetheless, it's, the, the important point is if we sort of stop talking about it, then you'd have the sense that something of our humanity had failed. Um, and I'm not just talking about the body beautiful or the beautiful summer's day when they come around rather infrequently here in London at the minute, um, or the beauty of pleasure or even the beauty of company, uh, much as we love that as at the idler. But it's at, at this time, you know, we've been thinking about things like the beauty of care, um, the beauty of hope. Um, the beauty of loving and connection. Um, the, there's the terrible beauty that can overwhelm and yet somehow opens life up. Um, even the beauty of suffering and, and, you know, maybe even the beauty of death. Although one says that hesitantly because you never quite know how these things are going to strike you. Um, and yet it's often at these times that we know more about love than we ever did during normal events and so on. So beauty reaching right across the whole of life. And, and this is the sort of key philosophical point actually, is that all the best philosophers of beauty, in my view anyway, realize that one of the amazing things about beauty is that it can actually be found everywhere. If you have the eyes to see it and the eyes, the ears to hear it um, and the, the capacity to sort of spot it and align with it. Um, and they've said that it's because beauty is a kind of quality of being itself. It's part of what it is to be alive. It's like another name for living and thinking and being conscious and um, reaching out and needing and yearning. Um, it's, a, it's a name that weaves through all those different things. Um, and it's why, you know, for example, Socrates, his iconography always shows him to be ugly um, with a balding head and uh, pudgy eyes and, and moobs and things like that. Um, and yet it's his inner, inner beauty that shines through. That's kind of the point um, that even uh, um, you'd had to be quite beauty blind not to see the Socratic beauty. Um, I also like it because it kind of, it feels to me like it counters power play, um, which is, you know, feels so much to be shaping culture at the minute and it can hold different perspectives together. Um, it, it values and can see beauty and diversity. Um, and also I like it because it's kind of useless. It's gratuitous, it's free. Um, you know, the beauty of the summer's day when they come is just like everywhere. And you just have to step outside to appreciate it. And so that's quite a relief in an otherwise very utilitarian kind of instrumental, everything's got to have a kind of salute, be a solution or have some sort of drive, you know. Um, turn to the beautiful and just relax. Um, so this is sort of a call to beautify life, not in the cosmetic way, although that's kind of fun, but more at depth. And here's my little French philosopher quote coming to an end um, by Michel de Montaigne, very good French philosopher to read if you want to read a bit of French philosophy, he writes these essays trying himself um, and many of them are just very fun and interesting to read. 
Um, and he said, the beautiful souls are they that are universal, open, and ready for all things. I like that. They're universal. They will say yes to everything. They're open in welcoming everything, and they're ready for all things. They've got something they can hold on to, beauty, regardless of what happens. Um, so I perhaps wonder, Tom, Viv, whether you might agree this is something that the French have given us more pragmatic and empirical Brits. Um, but whether or not this is something you pick up now, let me hand back to you. Well, thanks, Mark. And we are an anti-utilitarian magazine at The Idler. And uh, that's why I really enjoyed Viv's book, because it's really a, it is a celebration of the way the French live, I suppose. Um, the title, Au Revoir Tristesse, I, I'm not going to talk for the whole way through. I will let you talk in a moment, Viv, by the way. The title of this of your book is Au Revoir Tristesse, which is obviously a play on Francois Sagan's novel <clears throat> when she was 17. Um, and that's your first chapter. And it's all about, really, just about how she sort of grabs hold of life, isn't it? I mean, what was it that, just go back a little bit. I know you talk about it in the book, but could you tell us when you first fell in love with this sort of insouciance uh, de, of, of the French? Mais Tom, je croyais qu'on allait faire cet événement en français. On avait, on avait fait un accord. Oui, OK. Um, <laughs> je parle français. <laughs> I'm joking. Okay, okay, avec to... toi. Um, I, wanted see... <laughs> I wanted to see how you would react to that. Bienvenue tout le monde. Bonsoir. Uh... <laughs> Bonjour à nos amis aux États-Unis. Welcome to everybody. Uh, don't worry, don't worry. We're not going to do this in French. Right? I think we should. If people want to ask questions in French later, we should. We, we, um, we, we, we yeah. can have a French. Yeah. Question. So you. Your question was about why, basically, why write this, uh, and I love that you say it's anti-utilitarian and this must be embraced like it's basically like saying your book is totally useless and and I, I embrace that like I wanted to write something that isn't supposed to have some kind of academic um, quality to it it isn't trying to um, add to that there's an incredible academic body of work about all the writers that I write about in this book and I'm definitely not trying to compete with them and for me what I wanted to do was create a love letter to reading and to our experience as readers. And as a kind of side order, it's all French. So it's a bit of a mashup between our lives as readers, which I think is something we don't think about very much. And I think is so important. I think a lot of the really key emotional and psychological relationships we have in our lives are with writers. They're with people who died hundreds of years ago. Um, but it's also a love letter to France and Frenchness. And, I wanted to really give a nod to Françoise Sagan and Bonjour Tristesse because I was in my teens when I first discovered, uh, I started learning French when I was 11 at school and I really got into French life and going on school exchanges when I was in my teens. And it was around about that time that I discovered through Clive James, if people remember his amazing TV shows on the BBC, Postcard from Paris. Uh, he interviewed Françoise Sagan and I would have seen that when I was about probably 14 or 15. And it was a huge moment for me to see this incredibly crazy woman driving at high speed with Clive James kind of whimpering next to her. Uh, she virtually knocks somebody over and, and he's like, oh, do you think you better stop the car? Because I think that you've just killed a pedestrian. Uh, and I just thought, oh, this is just, it's another world. You know, that whole, for me, I, I grew up in Somerset. I grew up in a small place called Bruton, which has since become extremely trendy. But when I grew up there, it was not trendy at all. No internet no real access to being able to order books or, or you know have the life that we can have now at the, at the push of a button and for me that exoticism of Frenchness and the wildness of a woman like Françoise Sagan who wrote Bonjour Tristes when she was 17 and became a phenomenon that was all so inspiring to me so I wanted to write something that would capture all of that but that would also examine the role that these books have in our lives and alongside that the role that Frenchness has in our lives. No, it, it's written predominantly for a I guess an uh, English speaking um, audience you know it was this book was first published in America and then it's come out in the UK so this isn't really like a British take on Frenchness it's a sort of global take on Frenchness where I think no matter where you come from you're expected to think 
of the French in a certain way, that they're the pinnacle, you know, as Mark suggested, um, they really understand beauty, they really understand happiness, they understand sex, they understand food and wine better than anyone, you know, does this really stand up to scrutiny? And does it actually say more about us that we're willing to buy into that sell that the French have been selling us for years that they're the best? Now, would you say they are idlers? But by the way, um, let me just say to everyone out there, what the, the structure of your book, Viv, is um, 12 essays about great French writers, Camus, Victor Hugo, etc. Um, and in our chat just before this started, I was saying to you, well, you know, they're, 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 they're sort of like literary essays. I mean, if you'd written those at university, you know, you would have got a first. I mean... They're, they're, they're very chatty, they're, they're packed with good gags, um, but there's a lot of analysis in there as well. And it's the kind of thing that really should be given to A-level students and university students who are, who are studying these books, or in fact, anyone before you read it. Well, thank you, Thomas. It's very kind of you. That's OK. Yeah, yeah um, well, I, I, I studied French and Russian at university. And for me, one of the big attractions of a lot of these books, and I'm really interested to see if um, you know people watching this identify with this as well. One of the attractions is that I discovered these books in my formative years. You know, I think a lot of people would feel the same about lots of Jane Austen's work or about Jane Eyre. You know, these are books that usually we discover when we are aged between sort of 14 and, and 21 maybe. So I'm thinking about if you're interested in, in France, then you probably would read Les Miserables, you might read Madame Bovary. Um, I've also got like Les Liaisons Dangereuses in there. Uh, I've Cyrano, uh, Camus L'Etranger. Uh, these are all books that I think often are seen as books that you read in adolescence. And for me, that was something that was really interesting to think about is, what is uh, what's the particularity about these books that we push them on adolescence and I think we sort of still do I think we expect them to read them less now <laughs> than we might have done say in the 70s 80s and 90s but we these are books that we push on people at a certain stage of life and I always come back to these books like every 10 years I'll reread these books and I find that I change and I grow in accordance with the book. So I'll often come back to a book and rediscover it and see how I've changed in relation to the way that I read it um, when I was young. So for example- You'll see, comp you'll see completely different things in it. Um, absolutely, you know, uh, yeah. Your age that you would have done at 17. Yeah, and because a lot of these books as well, you know, the theme of this, uh, of all of these works is some kind of pursuit of happiness, which is really probably the unspoken theme of most of literature is, you know, how are you supposed to be happy in this life? What are you supposed to do to get through it and, and not be miserable? <laughs> and I found that books like um, Flaubert's Madame Bovary, the theme of happiness is really linked always to love. Um, it's really true of Madame Bovary. It's pretty much true of like the whole of Proust. Uh, love and happiness are really, really interlinked. And I think that's one of the reasons that we are attracted to these books as teenagers as well, because we're discovering for the first time what it means to be in love, what it means to have a relationship, what it means to have your heart broken. And with something like Madame Bovary, uh, you know, you re I read that as sort of age 17, 18, when I was going up to university. And I thought all the men in it, um, you know, Rodolphe, Léon, all of Madame Beauvoir's lovers were really, really hot and that her husband was a complete loser. And that kind of is the plot of Madame Bovary, really. But then I read it later in life, you know, now as a, um, I was going to call myself a dowager, but I don't even know what that means. But as a middle-aged, married, late, uh, mother of three, I read that back and I... And you I see the easier the attraction of the boring I, then. Exactly. I can't stand Leon and Rodolphe anymore. And I don't want to go bouncing around in the back of a carriage and have baskets of apricots with love letters delivered to me. I want to help Charles Bovary, her hopeless husband. I want to stop him from, from doing the clubfoot operation. So it, it helps you to see how you change as a human being, how your compassion and your empathy empathy changes as you get older and I think there's something so comforting about that and it's something that you really only get from books and from the relationship that you have with that author. Now let's talk about this word boff mm -hmm. that you 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 uh cite as a, a fantastic French word in the Francois Sagan chapter in which we we put on the website this week on the other website 
And it's, it's a great word. You, you, you define it brilliantly. And like, um, I don't care. And I don't care that you don't care. And I don't care that anybody else cares. And I don't care about anything at all, really. Yeah, it's Something a like very, that. it's a really great idler word, isn't it? I mean, for anybody uh, watching, it's basically like, boof, you know, it's a, an okay, so, it's, on, it's, let's it's have a quick shrug. pronunciation lesson. Is it boof or is it boff? It, there, there's probably like a thousand different iterations of boff. So it could be a very, a sort of silent, or it could be boof. Uh, so, and, 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 you know, if anyone who's French watching will know that, like, a kind of boof is a real, like, how, why are you even asking? Okay, so you have to, you have to shrug at the same time. But if you were being kind, you might say boof, you know, and that means, oh, okay, you know, yeah. I don't really know. Uh, it can ex express a million things. And I love that they have a lot of expressions like this in French, and they do generally sort of vocalize them and they write them down so if you if you read asterix it's going to have boff in it um the first time i ever realized about these kind of phrases is when i well, the first time i went to a, a host family on exchange when i was about 12 or 13 i didn't really speak very good french at all but i was always trying so hard to listen and pick up and i remember saying to the mother of the host family um qu'est ce que ça veut dire what does it mean qu'est ce que ça veut dire abadidon abadidon and I thought this was like A B A D I N D O N G. Why do you keep saying abada da da ding dong? Because I all I could hear her say was blah 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 abadi dong, blah 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 abadi dong. What does it mean? Abadi dong is a bit like both. It, it but it means oh really? Because it means eh bien, dis donc. So oh well, uh, say therefore, eh yeah. bien, dis donc. So these so are the like first saying, thing that you should be taught to, when, when yeah, you're when it, you're it, yeah yeah. It's like saying you don't say. But if you listen to people, people speaking French, they'll go, blah, 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 and, and I just thought this was so funny. And I couldn't understand, like, why don't you get taught that at school? Because it makes up the majority of the French language. There's another word um, I used to get confused about in asterisks, which is B-E-N, which is really the bah. Bah. Yeah, well, bah is a contraction of bien. So it's like, oh. mm, yeah, bah is a really, really, really good one like that now i guess you're a fan of call my agent victoria and i've been watching we watched the whole of call my agent we thought it was one of the most brilliant things we've ever seen on television ever mm. um it's all about frenchness and what are your views on on this show viv yeah i absolutely love call my agent and i nearly wore out my sort of google search engine waiting for the last series to come because it was really uh, delayed because of covid or whatever uh, and i'm really confused now about whether it's finished or not there seems to be some rumors that there's going to be another series and there's going to be a cinema film of it so i don't think it's over um, but what exists already is completely perfect and we should be very grateful for it it's if for anybody who hasn't watched it yet it's on netflix and I think it's, uh, it's either four, four series and it's about a group of agents as in showbiz agents who run an agency and every single episode features a particular actor or actress who has a dilemma or a challenge and it's about like a famous one like Beatrice Dahl or someone like that yeah or it's, the Sigourney Weaver episode is is just <laughs> sublime and apparently she didn't even ask to see the script when when she was asked to do it and they chose her because she speaks pretty damn good French actually uh, yeah I love it I think the attraction of it for us um, certainly as Brits I'm very interested to see other nationalities uh, watching who might be into it I think it is a brilliant example of something cultural that feels very current and makes you feel like you're in with the in crowd and you understand what French people are thinking about and what they're talking about but it has no politics in it at all so when you watch it, you're completely able to forget all about Brexit. You can pretend that everything's still normal. And like these people could be your friends if you lived in Paris because everything is great. Uh, and it also gives you a great little in into that French cinema world, which is just so unusual and so incredible. You know, the French cinema industry is vast. It's massive. And you have all of these characters in it who we don't know about, but who are massive stars in France and it can send you down a sort of brilliant Google rabbit hole looking for all of their movies and it's just such a brilliant insight into contemporary French culture. Now would you say that the, that the French are idlers or, or, or not idlers? I mean they have this word wazif I think um, which means lazy or idle. 
There's also the idea of le flaneur. The flaneur, who was like the sort of Baudelaire, who was like to wander through the arcades with a tortoise on a lead, um, <laughs> making observations. Maybe it's something about, there's a sort of, just a slight sense that the French are kind of like both um, one step removed, you know, because slightly detached and looking at life, um, you know, from a slight distance in a sort of amused way. I mean, would you consider the French to be more idler-ish than you know, the Brits in general? Yeah, it's a really tricky one, this, I think, because you can definitely argue that the French are quite good at looking very cool whilst doing nothing. And that whole flaneur idea is is very seductive. You know, you just wander around the city and you read a bit of poetry and then you smoke a jetan. But I think that why we admire the French is because they do that almost as a pose. Like they do it because they want to see someone, they want to know that someone else is watching them doing it. Whereas I feel like the true spirit of the idler as defined by this type of idling, it's lying in a hammock and you don't care if, you don't care what anyone else thinks of you. You just want to be idle. Whereas I think the French take on that would like, you'd need someone to see you in your hammock. Otherwise it hasn't actually happened. We've gone right back to Mark and philosophy here. Um, yeah, the French thing is, is anyone ever truly idle if someone hasn't witnessed them being, being very glamorously idle? <laughs> That's a brilliant philosophical point. So. You're saying that they're sort of, if they are idle, it's a sort of theatrical version of idle. Yes. So it's yes. sort of like a sort of exaggerated version. Yeah. Um, the lobster on the lead or whatever it might be, or, you know. The, the yeah, come on, you carrot. take a lobster on a lead, that's not a casual decision. That's not true idling. <laughs> so they're not actually going to lie around doing nothing. But they, they are, they are, they're not, you, just, you know, you know, in America, um, uh, which is the ultimate utilitarian measure of everything, let's get rich country. Um, and saying something is French is almost a sort of term of abuse. It's something to do with, you know, um, not allowing free trade and uh, being sort of parochial and, you know, perhaps slightly lazy, I think. Yeah, I think that there's a really interesting divide in the way that France is regarded and I read a lot of uh, in particular American books about Frenchness when I was researching this book because I wanted to see how it differs from that British take and there was a real um, vogue you know in like late 19th century America um, for people of a certain class to say I've been to Europe um, to do the grand tour to you know you you can see that whole kind of um uh, Scott Fitz Fitzgerald on the in the French Riviera. There's an Americanness there, where where America is very close to France, and there's a certain kind of elision of some kind of artistic and bohemian values that's going on, and that is echoed actually in the song that you played at the beginning of this by Pink Martini, who are a band who who do covers like sort of cocktail lounge covers of of songs, a lot of them are in French, some are in Italian, some in Spanish, uh, but it's a real celebration of, you know, we're American and we're, we're multicultural Americans, um, but we love to celebrate European culture. And, and it's in a way, a sign of, of showing that you're interested in, in a world outside of that kind of uh, myth of the American dream, I suppose. And, and this book was published by an American publisher who publishes loads and loads of books about how gorgeous pavement cafes are in Paris and how to make the perfect croissant. And there's a whole culture of that amongst a particular kind of reader in America as a, as a form of, of tribute and as a form of escapism. And I really love that. So let's just go back to this idea of whether the French are idle or not. I mean, <laughs> you know, they, they, they did have this four, uh, four day week, didn't they? A few years about, well, maybe, probably a long time ago, 20 years ago now. Um, Macron said something like, you know, um, uh, I will never give in to this, uh, je ne céderai rien, ni au cynique, ni au fainéant, uh, ni au something or other, something, something, uh, ni, ni, au, ni au extreme. I will never give, give in to the layabouts, uh, the extremists or the cynics. Um, so in that, that seemed to me that he was sort of actually reacting in a, uh, you know, against something, you know, quite deep in the French soul, which is like a love of lying around being extreme and being cynical. 
Mm, I love that word, fineon. It's, um, yeah, like farniente. It really means like you're sort of so idle that you can't actually move. You're doing nothing at all. Yeah, well, there's, I think that that whole French working week and the strength of the unions, it really speaks to that um, contradiction that, that we were talking about, this idea that, yeah, the French are pretty good at being idle, but they need to have someone to watch them doing it. Similarly, they're very, very good at conserving their working time but they do it in a very bureaucratic and a very organized way. Whereas um, I think of the idler philosophy as being quite chaotic and as embracing like a British eccentrism and eccentricity and it's not organized. So yeah, the, I think, you know, the French are brilliant at contradictions. They're, they are, you know, the happiest and most miserable people in the world. Um, you know, this is something that my American, uh, the American editor, um, Jameson Schultz of this book said to me, he said, you know, it was a really, really sad moment for me when I realized that there are some really dodgy people who live in, in the UK, like there are sort of people who aren't very nice. And he always wanted to think of everything in Britain as being like, oh, so lovely. And he's like, well, that is also true. I was saying, you know, that's also true of the French, that, you know, there are pockets, we've all had We've all had bad meals in France. Uh, and it's always like way more disappointing than you if you have a bad meal over here. Like when the French do things badly, they do them really spectacularly badly. <laughs> um, but when they're, they're good, <laughs> they are really, really good. Now, what about Colette? She's one of your heroes. And I remember reading Colette and being really entranced by a quote from her, which is something like, um, it was about smoking. And she said, smoking simultaneously excuses idleness into your day um, uh, and, uh, and is also a, a way of injecting it into your day. So she said, it's a simultaneous injection and an excuse for idleness, which people call a fag break, I think. Um, <laughs> but she, she, was, um, she was basically an idler. I mean, she's very eccentric. Yeah, Colette is a fantastic character and... I feel a bit, the chapter in the book uh, is based on Gigi, so it's an examination of Gigi and how she came to write that and what was happening in her life at the time and what the book is about. And I'm a bit harsh on it because I, I'm not sure that Colette's work has really stood the test of time. You know, she was an extremely hardworking writer who was sort of put to work um, famously by her publisher of Willy uh, and he sort of really used her as as a workhorse a novelist for a particular kind of audience she was maybe one of the first um, kind of romance novelists of the early 20th century who was kind of churning out these uh, novels for, for women but also kind of slightly to titillate male readers and in some ways her work hasn't really stood the test of time because it feels incredibly um, dated and sort of semi-misogynist, I would say. It's sometimes quite difficult to read and it's at complete odds with her biography. And I think that her biography, uh, the life that she lived and the woman that she was is, is almost more interesting now than her work is. Uh, and I really enjoyed uh, the film with uh, Dominic West and I think it's Kira Knightley who plays uh, Colette, uh, which really depicts how she was used uh, in, you know, as a sort of mid, mid to late teens as, as a promising young woman writer. And she had to fight to reclaim that. Um, but yeah, fascinating woman and someone I really wanted to include because there were so few women writers from that period. But I think for modern readers, a problematic character. And you end the book with a, a lovely discussion of Le Tranquille by Camus. Um, and for him, he's the most fanciable of all the male writers in France, I think. Well, all, all, all the male writers that you talk about, because you, you, you don't like many of them particularly, Victor Hugo's <laughs> a bit grotty and so on. Um, but Camus is sort of a, a, above reproach. Yeah, well, it's really difficult. I do really love, I love these writers. And I was quite depressed sometimes when I delved, I'd already delved quite far into their biographies when I was you know, studying their work at university. But when I came to delve even further for the, writing this book, and I ended up you know, ordering a book that's called Pox, The History of Syphilis to assist me with my research, you get some idea of, you know, if you were a male writer 
and that you know perhaps women would have done the same thing there just weren't very many of them or their work wasn't published but if you were a successful male writer in 19th century France you were almost certainly riddled with venereal disease um, due to your extreme associations with prostitutes and I don't you know I know it's very fashionable now to bring a contemporary sensibility to everything and I try not to do that because you know don't hate on Guy de Maupassant um, just because um, you know he did have really really terrible syphilis um but he, you know i absolutely love his work and i really admire him as a writer and i think a lot of these writers were very tortured souls and it also when you delve into their their personal lives in terms of their finances you know you could you can see this like in in lots of different uh, places uh, from you know dickens through to any of the russian writers like tolstoy dostoevsky a lot of their biography is dominated by money worries uh, and so like the drinking and the prostitution of, in that time kind of goes alongside all of that is that they're having to churn, 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 churn out this work uh, to keep going. So I try and re well, well, re wouldn't give, reserve judgment. Um, they could save money on just by cutting out their prostitute habit, uh, presumably. Well, yeah, they could, but then I guess they wouldn't be having such fun times. Not that I'm defending that. No, you, you, your other book was about, uh, you did a similar thing um, previously with Russian literature. Uh, now, is, is Tolstoy in that? I mean, I, I know Tolstoy was a, a sort of a, um, you know, he was a soldier when he was young, but, but he became a, a sort of a Gandhi figure, surely, when he was older. Yeah, well, Tolstoy is, is a really difficult person to talk about in terms of his morality. And like, that's why I, I, I really do appreciate Camus and sort of like him in inverted commas as a man because his he's got some some dodgy bits in his personal story but not very many <laughs> but Tolstoy famously um wrote a diary which he showed to his wife bef on the night before their wedding and it destroyed her for the rest of her life because it was a complete a uh, detailed account of all of his encounters. And he had also had lots of venereal diseases. He had illegitimate children, um, but he did, um, you know, famously have an epiphany while he was writing Anna Karenina and his, um, him and he and his wife lost three children uh, in a row whilst he was writing Anna Karenina and it caused some kind of spiritual crisis in him alongside with other factors that further down the road led to him becoming this monk-like figure who did then lead uh, an almost ridiculously moral life so he was very much a person of extremes. What about Oblomov does he pop up in your... Um... Oh he's the laziest of them all isn't he? He's the ultimate lazy. Does everyone know about Obramov out there? I mean, can you sort of give a brief sketch of him before we go yeah, on? Yeah, I have to say, I have always avoided Oblomov because I don't like this cult around his laziness. So you probably know more about him than I do, you see. Well, he, he was, there was such a big cult around his laziness that Lenin called it Oblomovism. Um, and Lenin referred to Oblomovism as a sort of um, sickness in the Russian soul. The aristocrats who sort of sat around doing nothing, and everyone, everyone really should be should be working very hard. Um, but I just wonder, you know, if the author Gonchurov was saying something, you know, quite nice about the Russian soul, which is the Oblomov is a very sort of gentle character. Yeah, yeah, very possibly. I prefer to look at somebody like Chekhov to think about those things. You know, you think of the characters in Cherry Orchard or Uncle Vanya where yes they are very very good at being idle but it doesn't make them happy and that those plays are based around examining you know our inability to be comfortable when we're comfortable um, and there's something you know that's really interesting about that because i think no matter what nationality you are you, are, you perhaps aspire to, to being idle um but in in different nationalities and different cultures that is or isn't um, culturally acceptable or it has, you know, I, I mean, I definitely struggle to be as idle as I'd like to be because I feel as if I have like the weight of Protestant work ethic and the weight of my 
immigrant Jewish ancestry behind me saying, no, you must forge on. Uh, so I love the idea of being idle, but I think we all have a complicated relationship with it. Um, a lot of which is dictated by our, our culture. Well, you do seem to be extremely productive because it, as well as these brilliant books, uh, you've got, well, you, you've done the book about um, uh, giving, speaking in public, which you did performances at our festival, I think, last year. No, no well, when it was last on to you. Yeah. Um, and you've got a new podcast as well, which I think... Yeah, so I, I am a ridiculously unidle person and um, COVID has been really, really difficult for me I don't mean to like play violin like people have suffered way more than I have but I found it really difficult because I've had to teach myself to be quite idle uh, and I've I've taken up the cliched open water open water swimming which has helped me with that um, but not being able to be busy and going about the place the whole time has been really hard for me and yes um, I I did a book uh, three years ago, which is also a podcast called How to Own the Room, Women in the Art of Brilliant Speaking, which is a guide to all kinds of different ways of communicating with people, of performance, of celebrating uh, introverted speakers, asking what does it mean to be a great speaker, especially as a woman? Why do we tend to uh, concentrate on male speakers historically more than female speakers? And the podcast examines all of that. And we've interviewed people like Hillary Clinton, Margaret Atwood, Word, um, Nadia Hussein, who was fascinated, uh, fascinating on overcoming introversion and what, when she was going on uh, TV for Bake Off. And yeah, so that's been really fascinating. And before COVID, I was out on the road doing stuff around how to own the room the whole time. But then during COVID, that has turned into, of course, how to own the Zoom. So we've done lots of podcasts. How to own that. the Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As it had to be. <laughs> now, what are you drinking? The, the, I'm the, drinking, the, the, yeah, in, in tribute to my my French teacher at university, Jean-Pierre Darrault, I'm drinking Lille, which was his favourite tipple, um, which is, is a it? sort of a, I'd, I mean, don't quote me on this if you're a wine person, but it's a kind of fortified rosé, or like a very, very light pale port, I would say, so you just drink it on its own with some ice, um, there's another version of it, I, a similar cousin of it that's called Bir, B Y R R H, which is a, a red, dark red, uh, similar kind of aperitif type drink that I always remember my father in law um, ordering in a bar in France once he wanted to have five beers and he actually said, Cinq, cinq Bir. S'il vous plaît. And so this woman began to pour these aperitifs. Oh, I... And of course, he meant <laughs> Cinq Bières. Yeah, so I love, I love, yeah, little aperitif things. Lille, recommended. Oh, yeah, you're, you're just absolutely full of good recommendations for books and booze and and um, general ideas for good living. Now, Vic, have we got some questions from our lovely audience? I might just leave Hi, you, yeah. actually, while I've oh, been Mark, yeah. Uh, yeah, can, can you... Did, when I when I've been in France and if you if someone says you know what do you do and sometimes I'll even say you know I write philosophy or something, in in France everyone goes oh right you know what kind of stuff, and you can be in quite a provincial town and go to the Carrefour or somewhere like that and they'll have Camus and Sartre on the little bookshop shelves, um, whereas in this country you know say you write philosophy everyone goes oh don't speak to me about that I won't understand <laughs> that you know, so you know so, so there is a kind of um, an intellectualism or is it just is it a pride in French literature which is quite philosophical or what you know what what about that culture? Yeah I think that there is a culture of intellectualism is too strong a word but maybe a pride in being educated that is it's very different to the Anglo-Saxon tradition so for example the way that French school children are taught to write, like that their handwriting is extremely important. You have to have really beautiful handwriting. You have to be able to take dictation. You know, you do that from a very early age. And then when, once you've mastered handwriting and dictation, then uh, from sort of 10 or 11, you, you would be into doing philosophy and philosophy is on the school curriculum. And, you know, it's taught like English or maths uh, is taught. Whereas, you know, in this country, 
French is no longer even on the curriculum. You know, my, uh, when I was at school, French GCSE was compulsory. Um, my sister is a French teacher and, you know, French is no longer, language is no longer a compulsory uh, GCSE, except in Wales, where Welsh is a compulsory GCSE. And it's just, it's considered a, that you're well educated if you know about philosophy. Uh, and I'm, I'd be very surprised if English isn't a compulsory subject on the curriculum in France as well. I, I assume it still is. So it, I do think that they prize a more rounded education than we do. And they define a more rounded education in a much broader sense than we do that, um, that includes philosophy. Thanks. Um, in fact, David Villagers, you wanted to say something exactly on that theme. Have you, David, oh. are you there? Oh yeah, hello. So hi, Viv. Um, yeah, actually, so just wanted to give a quick shout out to another book you made, like Lift As You Climb, basically. Oh, bless you. Ba yep, basically I've seen it at a different Zoom webinar, I think it was last year, so I decided to order it for me. And also like another Zoom webinar you actually did on this book about French literature. So wanted to ask this question like, um, do you think it would be important for secondary schools, at least in Anglophone countries to have some type of teaching of philosophy, et cetera? I'm, I noticed that one news report here in the US was basically, um, uh, teach saying about like some people are advocating civics class but I would I personally believe it's much better for a philosophy class in an American high school so yeah do you, what do you think about that mm. well first of all I think you're the nicest person in the entire universe you have come with a, like a copy of my book lift as you <laughs> climb which is very much along the lines of the message of that book so thank you yeah my views on what should be taught in school I don't I could talk to you for hours but how uh, what weight would those views have right <laughs> I would argue that for a start I would always be biased towards language and I think it's a huge huge loss in the UK and a great reflection of what's happened with Brexit that we don't teach foreign languages in the way that we used to and I hear this from university lecturers that numbers have fallen off uh, you know I studied Russian the Russian department is is kind of fallen off since I was there um it's definitely the case with with all kinds of European languages at, from ages 11 to 18 in the UK. And, you know, I know from American colleagues that, you know, learning foreign languages is not something that's really hot over there either. And by accident, um, English as a second language has become the language of the world. And I don't think that really benefits um, any of us particularly actually. Um, should everybody be taught philosophy? Yes, of course, only in the same way that they should be taught literature. I really believe literature and philosophy should be taught alongside each other because they are basically the same thing. You know, literature is often uh, philosophy in story form. Um, but I would also argue that the things I wish I had been taught when I was um, at school was, um, you know, how to balance the books, how to get a mortgage, how to um you know how to fill in your tax forms <laughs> and you're not taught any of those things either so uh in the uk at least i think we still have quite a bizarre education where it's supposed to be practical but it's actually not that practical but it isn't that intellectual either so i would really like to have much of the more airy fairy philosophy and literature and loads of practical stuff from the sort of people who are on dragon's den Brilliant. Thanks. Well, great question, David. Thank you. Thanks, Viv. I love in your book, um, Viv, the way you bring in these beautiful phrases and curious phrases that the French use. And in particular, I loved um, their word for happiness, which is so right, which is... Le bonheur. Le bonheur, the good yeah, hour. The like good hour. as if it's going to be, this is the good hour. It's not going to be next hour or, you know, always or... Yeah, Whereas it's lovely got, that. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, well, of course, you have like, you can say, je suis contente. Um, you can have la joie. But yeah, bonheur mm. is a particularly, it makes you smile to, to hear that word, bonheur. 
Yeah, I love you, that. You had quite a few which make you smile. The one for I washed my hands, the phrase for I washed my hands. Oh yeah, well, this is one of the things that charmed me from the age of 11 when I started learning French. And then I, I, I did for my uh, A-level Spanish, German, Latin, and then I did Russian at university. So I am super geeky linguist in all languages. I love to translate in my mind what it means in English. So in French, to say I wash my hands, you have to say je me lave les mains because it's reflexive verb. Je me lave les mains. I wash myself the hands. And so I loved whenever I would learn something new, I would not only learn je me lave les mains, that's how you say it in French, but I would learn, oh yeah, you have to remember, I wash myself the hands. And I just love <laughs> so that. So, so uh, pour quoi would be for what, I suppose. Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. What about next part? Is it not, 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 not? <laughs> no, yeah, what, is, is, is this not that? <laughs> n'est-ce ne pas? I wish you were my French teacher. I wouldn't have gone off it. <laughs> uh, well, my sister is a brilliant, brilliant French teacher. <laughs> well, maybe we should get her teaching um, uh, an online course on the Idler Academy. Definitely. Great. Well, there's a plan. Um, but Stella Sims, a bit more on Francophilia. Stella, will you ask your question, please? Sure. Um, I think I probably worded it better in the chat, but I'll try and think of it. Um, I, Viv, I wondered... Um, why you thought the British are particularly prone to kind of being Francophiles? Because I always find it really fascinating. On the one hand, there's some people who really hate the French, and then there's some British people who just love it and are fascinated by it and, and sort of almost um, idealise it in a way. Mm. Um, I mean, do any other, does this exist in Italy, Germany? Do you, would you ever get a German Francophile? Like what's specific about the British that we just love it? Um, I'd just be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And it's one I do try to grapple with a bit in the book. And a lot of it is to do with the dominance of France and French culture in the 19th century, which found its way across uh, to the United States. And it was equally, you know, dominant in Germany, Italy, Spain, everywhere. Was that, you know, you, you would have seen Les Miserables as being a really, really important novel. Flaubert was really, really important. Um, the Russians were important, but they were quite a long way away. Um, you get quite a lot of uh, cross fertilization between the Russians and the French. Actually, you have people like Turgenev doing a bit of a tour, uh, which would have included France during that time. And there's a lot of links between, say, Paris and St. Petersburg. So it, a lot of it is to do with the dominant culture of the mid to late 19th century. And that is when you see the rise of things like shops, restaurants, uh, early 20th century fashion, perfume, Coco Chanel, you know, the, I mean, I'm giving a very broad brush kind of historical view here, um, but all of those things were dominated by Frenchness. And it just so happened that all of that coalesced and France was able to become dominant in a lot of those commercial fields, a culturally commercial fields quite early on. Um, the British relationship with France, I think, is, is pretty simple. It's because we're so close to them. You know, I was laughing the other week thinking, oh, yeah, let's really celebrate a trade deal with which we have with Australia, which takes I don't know how many days it would take you to go to Australia on a boat. Well, definitely more than a week, right? Well, you can swim to France. <laughs> you know, like France, they are our neighbours. Like we, we, we live next door to them. And always, you know, psychologically, a relationship between neighbours is fraught. You know, it's a love-hate relationship. And I think it perhaps was difficult for us historically to, uh, as the, in inverted commas, British empire, from which we are only just recovering now and recovering in quite a bad way, um, in the late 19th century, seeing France be dominant in all of these fields and us being the poor relation um, and not being cool. And then, you know, in the late 20th century, trying to reclaim everything with cool Britannia. And I noticed, you know, around the time of Brexit, you know, so many contradictions about how we're supposed to feel towards the French. And the narrative came up around Brexit that, oh, no, this is not about hating the French. I love, I love, uh, I love a good Malbec. You know, I have a holiday home in in the Dordogne, but I'm still voting Brexit. Like this is, it, it, and that sort of drove me crazy because it made me think that you know, for some people, this love is very 
superficial and it's a one-way street it's we go there and we take what we want and we do what we want and we don't feel a connection whereas I think for those of us who who would oppose that and who would love to see that decision reversed in the near future it's about that being a two-way street that you know yeah you have a love-hate relationship it isn't always great you don't always agree about things but there are things that you love about their country there are things that you really appreciate about their culture and you're going to take the rough with the smooth you're not just going to take the good bits and sort of jet in and out when you feel like it psychologically the teenage Sorry, I went quite angry there. Sorry, Stella. Great. Uh, I I know this point has been made many, many times, but they've never done pop music very well, have they? I mean, they didn't have punk or Teddy Boys or anything like that, rock and roll. I beg to differ. Wow, wow. And we're going to be talking about that in a minute, Tom. Can we come back to the the pop? Guys, Google Johnny Halliday. Your evening will be made. That's why everyone says Johnny Halliday. That's just one person. We have about a million amazing punk bands, for one thing. Yeah, it's, it is very, very hard to argue against the dominance of English-speaking <laughs> music. Um, but I've got a very high sense of camp and kitsch, and so I love French pop music from Mélène Farmer to France Gall uh, to uh, Jean-Jacques Goldman. Yeah, 1980s French pop music kid. Well, we're looking forward to hearing maybe something a little in a, in a couple of minutes' time. But we'll just quickly try and squeeze in two more questions. Can we have Joy Warren Adamson? Please, are you there, Joy? Oh, uh, sorry, that's me, actually. Oh, that's I'm you. A, Hello. I was, sorry, I'm with Joy. I was an I assistant just... I was an assistant in a lycée in, in the 1960s, and the third year always used to give me hell. And I tried all sorts of books and I said, well, what's the one that you really like best? And they all said to a student, Le Grand Moon. And uh-huh. Does that endure as a favourite book? Because it's, res- you know, it, for me, it, I read it probably every year because it just gives me everything of France. And yet, actually, it's about pre-First World War atmosphere, isn't it? Yeah, Joy, you have reminded me to go back to it because I've not thought about it or read it in, yeah. in years. <clears throat> but yeah, that at one point that was a huge thing. Not now. No, I, I don't know. Other people might disagree, but I wouldn't say now. I, I did it for Frank J. Little, Le Grand Moon. I think it was, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was the sort of standard A-level text in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, we had to read it. I think it must be in GCSE we had to read it. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, maybe it's died now with our young... Just an extra question. to pronounce Moon. moon. When, I was an, when I was an assistant, there was Surveillant who, mm-hmm. who used to run the lycée. Do they, are they still there? Because they, they, as long with the third years, gave me hell as well because of my French. Okay, um, yeah. So, so as, as, yeah, my French pen friend's mother was a Surveillant, uh, which is a very interesting role in a school. It's, it's like a sort of permanent supply teacher. Yeah. So you're like a spare teacher, but you're there all of the time, which is a fantastic pastoral role. And um, yeah, right. as far as I know, still exists. But yeah, those guys rule the roost. So they're going to give you hell as an incomer, I would imagine. Yeah. Thank you. Well, do you know what? Um, OK, very quickly, John Spracklin, can we squeeze one more question in, Viv? Yes, of course. Um, we'll do John. Yes, yeah. John, are you there? And oh, I was going to I was going to ramble for ages about I Proust, who is my great hero <laughs> and will always be first on my fantasy dinner guest oh, list. Brilliant, um, but, but not for ages. But, but, but thinking about Proust, um, you know, he he um, his, many of his characters were were sort of ex- and, and him and he, him himself was, was an extreme Anglophile. You know, he loved Ruskin and he loved all things English, and many of his characters use these English idioms as, as an affectation. Mm-hmm. Um, so much the same way that we sort of fetishise the French, you know, Proust and his contemporaries had that attitude to the English. Oh, that's such a wonderful point. Yeah, I, I was so surprised when I first went to France in my teens and found that there were loads of French teenagers who were crazy about the cure. <laughs> because they're like, oh, British culture is so amazing. You've got the Smiths and the Cure. I was like, it's just the Smiths and the Cure. But yeah, we, we are more exotic over here than, than we think. And there is, as you say, in French literature, a rich tradition um, of borrowing and admiring. And, you know, that I think that's part of 
the attraction that I'm trying to mine in this book and, and examine is, you know, why are we so fascinated and so in love with the thing that we can never be? Oh, well, on that note, I that wonderful note, I think we should end and everybody do buy au revoir, Trista. Tristesse, I can't even say it. Tristesse. <laughs> so charming and so inspiring and um, all Viv's wonderful curiosity and charm comes through it right the way through. So I recommend that very much. Um, will you all please unmute your microphones and give Viv an enormous round of applause. <laughs> 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 <laughs>